introduce my colleague and good friends, Dr. Satish Kukarini, and uh, to tell you about uh, his very, very interesting life in one or two sentences. He might uh, uh, say more, but I need to apologize because uh, it happens that uh, I have been invited to give another talk across the campus um, because we have collaboration with University of Oslo and they came this, this weekend so I have to go and talk uh, uh, about our research and collaboration with them. But let me um, uh, tell you something about uh, Dr. Kulkarni and he will give a talk actually of what's going on with uh, um, collaboration between India and United States, and it goes a little bit up in one direction, a little bit down <laughs> over a uh, different period of time. And India, we just discussed uh, um, half an hour ago, India does not have uh, many options but to uh, continue um, investing in um, uh, technology and the field. So you will hear about it. Um, Dr. Kulkarni, worked at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory for 26 years, and his latest, uh, most recent uh, assignment was a director, the division leader of nuclear technology for the nuclear tests, engineering division. And then um, he became executive director at UC Office of the President for laboratory management, and we collaborated uh, um, that period of time because uh, uh, I got one of the grants that was funded partially by this UC lab management fee. So we worked to organize six Asia Pacific forums and to invite colleagues from India as well. Uh, then after that, uh, in 2006, he was selected to serve as the counselor for science, technology, environment and health affairs in uh, the U.S. Uh, Embassy in India and during that period of time he also helped me out to push through the system um, visas for my colleagues from India that I invited to come and it wasn't easy in that period of time. Uh, and then um, after he finished uh, uh, this limited term foreign service uh, uh, work. In 2009, he joined Georgetown University as Associate Vice President for New Initiatives and Partnership. And later in 2011, he was appointed Director of Energy Initiatives at Virginia Tech. And again, uh, he was one of the organizers of uh, uh, something called Nuclear Regime's Future Outlook. So he invited me to come and give a talk uh, uh, about that as well. Um, and uh, uh, he retired in 2014 and came back to California. Yes. So welcome, uh, and I'm happy to be your host uh, this afternoon, but uh, after I leave, I would ask either Rebecca or Kai to um, lead question and answer part. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmina, and thank you all for being here and inviting me. Um, I'm really not uh, new here. As Jasmina said, I've spent about 28 years at uh, Livermore Lab, two years in the UC President's Office, and at that time I had a lot of interaction with uh, the department, actually, I will mention that. And uh, in fact, Jasmina and I have worked also uh, in 2009, I'll talk about it in 2011, 2012. So I'm sort of a back home among, among friends. So my talk today is really uh, about uh, what I would call as the, the principal foreign policy initiative of President Bush uh, in, in the second term. Uh, of the U.S.-India nuclear deal. And 
I think if you put that in the context of what is happening in North Korea, you will probably see a lot of similar things, although the two countries are different, but uh, very similar things have happened at that time. Uh, if you see here, when I was in New Delhi, is it? I did come up with a logo for my science office in the U.S. Embassy, and it was, uh, you know, the DNA, you know, effectively saying that there is a common DNA between U.S. and India on science, technology, environment, and health affairs. So what is the, uh, the, 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 what I'm going to speak today, I think it's very important to really frame my talk within the context of what India is. I think that is very important for you to understand uh, the social and the political aspects. Because anything you want to do with nuclear, uh, politics comes into play all the time. Uh, so I think uh, we need to understand what the U.S. and India relations have been and where they are headed at this time. <clears throat> then I'll say a few words about India's nuclear program, and that includes nuclear power and a little bit on nuclear weapons because they are actually all you know, put together, combined. I'll also talk about post-nuclear test sanctions and tensions because, as you know, typically the U.S., if it doesn't like what other countries are doing, you know, you end up in sanctions. And when you have sanctions, you know, different forces are at play, and so we need to understand what all that means. I will also discuss as to what has been the transformational diplomacy between U.S. and India, something which is very interesting, which probably has not happened with other nations here. And then I will say mention something about what is exactly happening now. Uh, clearly, uh, unlike some of the other countries, uh, India is moving full steam ahead in nuclear power. Yeah, they have to. So there is a element, what I call as a civil nuclear agreement and current status, which is the commerce side of the interaction. Then you have the NRC, the ANS, the Fermi Lab, and um, uh, INL and LLNL, you know, which is the R&D aspect you know, within India. Then something which I have worked with Jasmina is the nuclear engineering department heads, you know, partnership between US and India, which is the education part of it. And there are some other elements also which I will discuss. I think I better go up there, this is not working. mentioning that indeed uh, there is a relationship between what I have done and uh, Berkeley. Just about a day before I left for India in 2006, in June, we had actually a forum at UC Berkeley that was actually called the performance-based design of nuclear energy systems. And in fact, Professor Per Peterson was the co-chair of this. So just before I left for India, actually, uh, I had a lot of interaction with this department and we had sponsored a forum you know, as part of the UC office of the president. <coughs> so a uh, little bit about India. 
it has a population of 1.25, 1.3 billion. Uh, it is the world's largest democracy. It is a very functional democracy. Uh, and it is a pluralistic society, much like the US, a secular society. And probably the most diverse you know, mix of races, religion, and languages. So it's a complicated innovation. And to make things happen there, whether it's a nuclear deal or any other social program, is quite a major challenge. <coughs> then <coughs> the rate of population growth, which is of course one major issue, is actually going down. <coughs> but fundamentally, the resources are limited, so the per capita availability of resources is a big challenge. So one has to always recognize that. <coughs> then literacy, education levels are rising, but <clears throat> what I would call an underemployment and unemployment is about 20%. So uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, what I call uh, aspirations among the population, but uh, uh, to employ so many people you know, in meaningful tasks is quite a challenge, especially if you have an open democracy, uh, unlike probably China. <coughs> There is a large middle class, which means that actually fuels the growth engine, uh, but many are still at or below the poverty line. And something of interest is actually India is now the largest milk producing nation in the world. <clears throat> so a little bit about uh, the scientific uh, aspects, let's go back in the past. Uh, you probably know if you have studied the history of India that two of the major global universities back about uh, almost 3,000 years ago were established in Takshashila and Nalanda. Uh, uh, and at that time, it was an international university with about 10,000 students from all over the world. But now, of course, you know, that is not there. But uh, it has a very uh, great tradition of education and what I call uh, international you know, students also. Uh, many of you probably do not know, but the technology for rust-proof super plastic uh, steel existed in India. If you know, if you heard about Damascus steel, that is actually from India, who used to actually export you know, ingots, uh, ingots of steel. And that's how the Damascus steel was actually manufactured in the Middle East. <coughs> Uh, I think uh, probably uh, just before independence in the early part of the 20th century, India produced a lot of uh, well-known scientists. Uh, some of them are the Nobel laureate C.V. Raman, uh, Satyan Bose, you know, we worked with Einstein, Jagdish Bose, you know, the uh, wireless person with Mar Marconi, and then Ramanujan, you know, the mathematician. So. Uh, a lot of contribution to science, even when there was no R&D infrastructure at that time. So sometimes, you know, the question I have always posed is that after so much investment since uh, uh, independence, so why is it that India has not produced an indigenous Nobel laureate? I mean, in science and technology. So this is a question which is actually being asked at the present time. Maybe most of us came here and that was the reason, but that is one of the things which is being questioned at this time. So, uh, I think uh, India has actually developed uh, two major areas very well. One is space program and the nuclear. And the nuclear program actually was developed mainly because of the sanctions, and I'll come to that later. And so there was a lot of indigenous effort at that time both in the space program as well as the nuclear program. And you probably know that India has sent a mission to the moon, and then it has a spacecraft which is going around Mars, and they are going to launch another mission to the moon. So they are quite advanced and quite sophisticated in the space and the nuclear area also. Uh, however, uh, I think was something I want to mention here, since I am from Livermore Lab, that uh, many of you probably don't know, but in 1994, Liverpool launched a mission to the moon. 
and that mission actually was called Clementine. Now, what happened later on was the NASA folks were very upset <laughs> that Livermore is you know, in there, you know, on their turf. So the, I think the resident office said, no, you, you are no longer supposed to do that. But the reason I bring it up is the project manager of Clementine, Arno Letterberg, I don't know whether any of you know it, know of him. Uh, he was a consultant to India's moon program uh, when I was in New Delhi. So there is a relationship between Livermore's Clementine moon mission and India's moon mission also because the architecture of the missions were very similar. But the big challenge in India is that in the defense side, uh, the, uh, I think the country lags because although it has the third largest standing army, it really doesn't have a very strong, uh, what I would call, robust infrastructure in the defense industry. And there are many reasons for that, and I don't really want to dwell on it today, but uh, that is one of the drawbacks. India also has a very strong, uh, I would call, uh, private enterprise, uh, something which I want to mention here. Uh, the, the present uh, head of the person who heads up the, uh, what I would call uh, the energy sector in India, his name is Mukesh Ambani, and he's actually nowadays called the, the Rockefeller of India, by the way. So if you go back in time, the Rockefeller was involved in oil exploration and things like that, and Mr. Ambani is something like Rockefeller. And then in steel, in fact, the world's largest steel producer is Mr. Mittal, by the way. And he is uh, termed as the Carnegie of India. If you know, back in time, Carnegie was a major person you know, who had steel production. So I think there are many uh, national brands. Uh, for example, uh, Jaguar is owned by Tata's, which is an Indian company. Uh, IBM is actually the second largest private employer in India today. Uh, and just imagine that three decades ago, uh, they had quit India. So a uh, lot of things are happening there. Now, U.S.-India relations, uh, as you know that uh, when India got its independence, and I'm sort of giving you my personal opinion here, not the Department of State or the Government of India, so I'm speaking for myself here. Uh, in spite of both countries being democracies, uh, they really were really not uh, together, and there are many reasons for that. Uh, but effectively, the relationship was, I would call, like a tango. You know, the, the tango dance is, you know, there's a lot of action, and then there is suddenly quiet, and a lot of action, and there is quiet. So it's exactly like that. It is a tango. Uh, initially, it was a development assistance model. Uh, India received almost like $14 billion in aid, uh, sort of a, after Israel and Egypt, you know, back in, in those days. And uh, during the early 60s, there was a problem with the food supply in India. So the US supplied a lot of wheat to India at that time under what they call the Public Law 480 scheme. And that amounted to about $3 billion of total amount of wheat. Imagine $3 billion in the early 60s that translates to about $25 billion in today's dollars. So uh, that effectively, the $3 billion, uh, $2 billion was excused, and the $1 billion which was not excused was kept as, uh, uh, kept as money in the US embassy in rupees, in the Indian currency. And those rupees, you know, $1 billion worth rupees at that time, were effectively used for two major initiatives with, between US and India. One was the Green Revolution, which you probably heard of, and the second was uh, the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, which I, which I come from, which was developed as part of a consortium with US University, UC Berkeley was one of them. So, uh, and then, 
the remaining portion of the one billion dollars which was in rupees was actually spent on scientific partnerships. But something I will not go into detail, but I'll just make a statement that because of bad politics between the two nations for so many years, such a huge amount of money was actually wasted. So when I reached India in 2006, out of the 900 or a billion dollars which was left in Indian rupees at that time, what was left for me to manage was 25 million dollars. And all that money was sort of a wasted, you know, and I don't have time to discuss that uh, because of bad politics between the two nations. So, uh, as you know that uh, President Obama was the chief guest at the Republic Day Parade, you know, back in 2015, and they have invited President Trump again, and I don't think they have heard back from the President whether he will attend or not. But one major thing that has happened in the political sphere that the Trump administration is now uh, recasting this the Asia Pacific Partnership into what they call as an Indo Pacific Partnership. And so this is a major political shift in what the US government is doing and has a lot of implications in terms of where the US India relations will go in the future. So, uh, coming back to energy. Now, India does have a major energy challenge. Unlike probably other nations like Germany who are saying that, well, we don't want nuclear power, or Taiwan is saying we don't want nuclear power, or South Korea says we don't want nuclear power. But in India, you cannot afford to make that statement because simply the amount of power requirements needed to you know, effectively electrifies you know, 1.25 billion people. You simply cannot do it just by renewable energy. You need nuclear power. So based on some of the estimates, as you can see here, uh, although they say that they will only require a small portion of it, the NWR, you know, which is uh, you know, the light water reactors, they think that in the interim between what they are doing now and what they expect to be in the future, say 30, 40 years from now, that the, the gap will be filled by the LWRs, which is where you know, the US and the French and the Russians, you know, they come into play. And this is a very, uh, although you know, it sort of a, looks like a small piece, but is a major piece. You know, in the present context. And I'll come to that a little bit more. So even though it has a very vibrant nuclear energy program, it is now wanting to build French reactors, you know, Russian reactors, they're already built. You know, they're talking with GE, they're talking with uh, Westinghouse. In spite of all of that, the total nuclear capacity is only 3.25%. So, while they are putting in new nuclear power plants, uh, the total energy requirement is also going up. So the percentage is uh, not moving up that fast. And compared to the US, you know, I don't know, it's about 19 or 20 percent nuclear power. Uh, I think uh, today, I think electricity coverage across India is approaching almost 100 percent, which is a major accomplishment. And the big challenge is the hydrocarbon reserves, so extractable coal, oil, and gas are uh, not expected to last beyond this century. So they need to be prepared. Uh, effectively, the only option is really to have a major increase in solar power as well as nuclear power. So what is India wanting to do? It has what you, uh, the three-stage nuclear power program. One of the challenges in India that it doesn't have uh, a lot of uranium reserves. So which means that they have to use natural uranium, which is where the Canadian you know, reactors come into play. And so they have uh, presently 
the nuclear power is really based on the Canadian, you know, can do reactors, which use a deuterium oxide as heavy water and natural uranium as fuel, 0.7%. And from that, they are getting depleted uranium and plutonium. They're separating plutonium, and then in the uh, the fast breeder reactors, which is the second phase, they are effectively putting thorium in there with the plutonium fuel and getting uranium-233 as a byproduct of that. And that uranium-233, along with thorium, is going to be the third stage. And India has a very large deposit of thorium sands, uh, probably second to Australia, I believe. So, <coughs> Uh, they are counting on this, what I call the three-stage, almost what I call a closed cycle, you know, fuel cycle. Uh, and they are making progress, but ultimately it's not like you just put in thorium and you get uranium-233, you know, one week, one year later. I mean, it takes a lot of time to do that. So, in the interim, which is what I was mentioning, they need to have, you know, some other option where the LWRs come in. So this is again the uh, same thing, but a little bit more detailed. Uh, so you can see what is happening with the Canadian CANDU type reactors. Although the US did, in, in the early 60s, uh, did have two BWRs, GE BWR, boiling water reactors, and then the VVERs with the Russian uh, reactors. So these were, uh, these are operating at this time. And then the second stage is the fast breeder reactor, which I was mentioning. And then the third stage is essentially the thorium base, which effectively uses the uranium-233 and the thorium. Now, they realize that you simply cannot have a lot of uh, what I call the third stage fuel, just like that. So either you develop new fuels um, materials, or the other option they are thinking of at this time is to have an accelerator, the proton accelerator, so that uh, with a proton accelerator with thorium, you can get uranium-233 out of that. But then, you know, all that requires time. And so, no matter what you say, the third stage program is probably their overall long-term game plan, but the interim to satisfy the power need, they must go to end the one. Something I want to mention here, uh, some similarities between, the, uh, between Japan and India. If you know that uh, in 2004, there was a major Indonesian earthquake, and there was a tsunami which came you know, from the Indonesian site to the, uh, the fast breeder reactor at that time was being constructed, and they had just uh, had a big foundation, and the waves of the tsunami which came actually inundated that you know, that uh, foundation, and I think about 35 people died from that. So, but the key thing I want to mention here is that at the time of the, both these accidents, the NRC-like uh, uh, organization in India, or in Japan at that time, were part of the advocacy group, which means that they were not separate like NRC is separate from, you know, uh, DOE, for example. And that, I think, they received a lot of criticism about that. And if I'm not wrong, I think they have finally separated the functions of the NRC-like organization from under the Department of Atomic Energy. And I believe the same thing has happened in Japan. So this is a very important step the government has taken. So uh, I think, as I said, that we need to understand not only the nuclear power requirements and issues, but also the nuclear weapons, because uh, back in 2006, 2004, uh, I think both the programs were sort of all together. So if you know what is happening, in fact, in North Korea, what the US is saying in the new nuclearization is that, look, we need to understand where you separate the defense side and the commercial side. So. <coughs> 
But at that time, back in India, I think everything was mixed up. So nobody knew where the plutonium was going and where it is coming from. So what was going on? <coughs> if you go to this, the fission device in 1970, the plutonium from the Canadian reactor, which where the US had supplied you know, the heavy water. So Canada cut off the exchange at that time. And the NSG, or the Nuclear Supplies Group, it was formed in 1975 as a counter to what India did in 1974. So uh, I think again, uh, come down to the NSG a little bit later. <coughs> now, you know that India refuses to join the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, because they think that it is, an, it is the compared to nuclear apartheid, saying that, well, the five nations which have uh, unilaterally decided that this is a club where nobody else can enter. So they are saying, well, I think I don't we, we agree with that. And so they have persistently refused to join the NPT. And this issue sort of became a factor in the US-India in the civilian nuclear agreement. I'll mention that. Then uh, later on in 1998, they had a series of five uh, underground tests. Uh, one of them was what they call the fusion device. And there was a lot of controversy about that fusion device in terms of the yield. And uh, I don't, again, want to comment on that, but uh, quite a bit of issues were discussed as to whether the government indeed had the yield or not you know, for the fusion device. But what, again, it did was uh, uh, invite some more sanctions, which President Bush, you know, decided to lift them in 2001. And this is where I think the U.S. Uh, evolved a new policy. And that policy uh, was that they wanted to somehow bring India into the nuclear, you know, group in spite of the fact that uh, India was not willing to sign the NPT. So it was a special case, which uh, obviously there's a lot of objection to that from many countries. And fundamentally, I think uh, what I know is that uh, they wanted to, and I don't mean to say in a negative way, but they wanted to come to China. I mean, that was the hidden message behind this. So with all this going on, what was really happening at the political level was there was a lot of, as I said, a lot of mistrust between the two nations fundamentally. And I noticed that myself when I dealt with the Indian side you know, over there. And so uh, what happened is you probably have heard of Stroke Talbot, you know, who is now the president of Brookings Institution. At that time, he was the Deputy Secretary of State. So at that time, in that period of about one and a half, two years, Stroke Talbot, who was the Deputy Secretary of State, and India's <coughs> Prime Minister, Mr. Jaswan Singh, met 14 times in cities which were neither in the US nor in India to effectively iron out all the differences and everything that effectively stopped you know, the two nations from moving forward. So the, can you, you can imagine uh, what has happened before because in the previous regimes, the US thought probably rightly that the India was more in the Russian camp or the USSR camp. And the India thought that, well, I think uh, we are both democracies, but US is born in the Pakistan and the China camp. So those types of issues you know, played really quite a bit in how they move forward. And this is actually a fact, so I'm not creating some uh, imaginary thing. This is how it happened. So you can see here that 14 times in seven cities between 1998 and 2000, and as I said, this was a major foreign policy initiative of the Clinton and the Bush administrations. And the US-India civilian nuclear agreement was the centerpiece, and as I mentioned, that in everything that was going on, Pakistan and China loom large in the background always.
So, <coughs> so what is really happening between US and India now? The first thing, as I said, the US-India civil nuclear agreement, the, everything started in 2005 when the Indian Prime Minister visited the US and agreed that we need to move forward in this US nuclear arena. So, uh, President Bush, from what I know, had himself decided at that time that he wanted the Indian civilian nuclear deal, period. So, this was a given fact at that time. So, obviously, there were a lot of negotiations, you know, behind the scenes, you know, how the agreement was uh, framed, how it was discussed, and so on and so forth. But, uh, and I, I will mention something here because there were times when the uh, the negotiations were tough, uh, they seemed to go nowhere, and then at that time I remember that the Indian side had a open access to Vice President Cheney. And I'm sharing this with you because some of these things are not very obvious uh, outsiders. Because if they didn't agree uh, on the negotiating table, and the government of India said that well, the US is not probably according to their point of view, that the demands were not uh, fair, then they would go directly to Vice President Cheney, and then Cheney would intervene, and not that Cheney always supported them, but that uh, channel was open to the Indian side. And something I want to mention here, uh, you know, in a political sense, and doesn't reflect uh, any of my preferences, but fundamentally at that time, <coughs> Uh, the ambassador to uh, uh, India was uh, uh, David Mulford. He was a close friend of the senior Bush, and he was an investment banker, very business oriented, and very driven person. I mean, he wanted to make sure that this agreement happened no matter what. But, as, uh, and again, I'm giving you my personal observation, many of the State Department officers who were involved in the negotiations typically are democratic leaning. So when you say democratic leaning, that means they are sort of more on the non-proliferation side. So here it is in the embassy, an interesting thing was played out that many of the officers were objecting to some of the things that were being done. And the ambassador, who is a representative of the president, saying that, no, I think we need to move forward. So this sort of a uh, political thing was laid out you know, on a daily basis in the embassy. So, and although this started in 2005, the actual operationalization of this deal happened only last year. And I'll come to that because it's not only the one, two, three agreement between US and India, but you needed to have a one, two, three agreement like that with Japan, because Japan owns Hitachi and Toshiba and Japan. So it was easier for India to get the one, two, three in, in the US, but much more difficult to get the one, two, three from Japan. So it took almost a decade for that to happen. Then uh, I think that there was an uh, understanding between NRC and the, uh, the Indian NRC, which is the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board, to exchange scientists uh, between Washington DC and New Delhi. So that agreement, I don't think it is uh, no longer ongoing, but at that time there was an agreement between the two. Then, as I mentioned, that India wanted to have an accelerator driven driven proton accelerator driven system to for thorium uh, conversion to uranium 233 which meant that they needed you know a proton accelerator and the proton accelerator is a Fermi lab so they had uh, in fact this is an ongoing thing with respect to uh, Fermi lab in terms of accelerator technology then uh, there is an agreement, an MOU between the ANS and the Indian Nuclear Society, and India now has an ANS chapter, you know, which was in 2011. 
and then something which uh, I'll mention that uh, the, the director of Livermore Lab, at my request, when I have talked with George Miller, if you know the director, written and invited India to join the NIF science program, the National Ignition Science Program. But sometimes uh, one of the big challenges for the US from, from, from my personal experiences also is that the Indian side sometimes doesn't latch on to some of these initiatives as they should. So here it is, a letter from the director of Liverpool Lab, George Miller, on top of that. I mean, George Miller was a very strong defense type of person. Inviting India to join the NIF National Ignition Facility Science Program, and the Indian side, you know, just said maybe, maybe not, maybe, maybe not type of thing, and it didn't happen. But anyway, uh, I think in 2013, the head of the NIF, Dr. Ed Moses, was in India, and there were some discussions around that, but I don't know exactly where it has gone. And then, as I mentioned, that I worked with Professor Yuhit. Uh, in the Department Head Engineering Organization, there is a understanding between NATO and India as to how the university should collaborate. So in fact, I was telling Professor Vetter that maybe we should look into that and see what could be done. Because many times when these types of agreements, you need a, what I call a strong, you know, uh, uh, what I call a, a person who is willing to put a lot of time and a champion you know, to make things happen. <laughs> and then uh, there is, in fact, the MOU between Idaho National Lab and the India Department of Atomic Energy. So if you look at the overall picture, there is a, a connection at the education level, there is a connection at the commerce level, and there is a connection at the R&D level. Now the question is, how does one engage within those mechanisms? So I'm going to go through this rather quickly because uh, the, rather than go through all the view graphs, the India-US nuclear deal, the fundamental thing which was needed is for the India to separate what they call as the defense side and the commercial side. So which means that those on the, on the commercial side would be under IAEA safeguards and those on the defense side probably would not be. And then, <coughs> so you can see here that uh, in return, the US would resume full civil nuclear cooperation with the US Congress amending its laws permitting such cooperation and the nuclear supply group lifting its sanctions. Now, I remember at that time what was going on, that India had just started his, uh, uh, you know, the fast breeder reactor program. So there was a lot of confusion at that time as to exactly what would come under what I call uh, safeguarded and what would not be under safeguarded. And so each side was basically trying to put as many things as safeguarded from the US side. And the Indian side was saying, well, I don't think this should be there, this should be there, so on and so forth. So uh, quite a lot of, uh, you know, uh, what I call difficult negotiations. And in fact, President Bush had arrived in New Delhi, but still there was no agreement. So there was uh, quite a bit of concern on the US side that uh, the president is in India, but there is no agreement as to what the separation plan is. But then the two prime ministers, the president and the prime minister of India intervened and they came up with a separation plan. So having come up with the separation plan, okay, so there are all these uh, things, I'm going to leave this copy with you folks if you are interested in looking at it. So they did come up with the separation plan and then the US uh, Congress, they had to vote to uh, approve the waiver that indeed the government of the United States can proceed with the negotiations under the Atomic Energy Act so they can have a one, two, three agreement. 
So the first step was taken by the Congress, and this is known as the Hyde Act. So the framing of the Hyde Act. So here again, uh, while the thing was being discussed in, you know, in the Senate and the Congress, there were two major objections to that. One was Senator Barbara Boxer from California, Tom Lantos, saying that India the vote at IA on the Iran issue. So can you imagine the whole Iran issue is not being replayed again today? Same, same problems, same issues. Okay. So at that time was quite a bit of concern at that time. And then Senator Rasen Feingold, uh, he was wanting to uh, see what India would do with the weapons program. What is uh, are they going to test? Are they going to do more testing? So all sorts of issues came up. And then uh, India objected to these conditions, but again, a lot of discussion, a lot of agreements, and the Congress essentially you know, voted for it. So this was a major first step. So after this, the US government in India then had to uh, prepare the 123 agreement. So the 123 agreement again was quite tedious, but fundamentally as I have told you that the Bush administration wanted this to happen, period. So while on the surface it appeared that things were not going well, I think uh, the crossing of the T's and the dotting of the I's and now the agreement were not moving forward, but people knew that this would happen. And I, I sort of knew that because in uh, as we went, came closer to signing the 123, uh, Ambassador Mulford effectively told the Indian side that, look, you need to give me a letter in writing that you will get 10 gigawatts of electricity from the US. Okay? And then we will move ahead. So the government of India did write a letter to the US government that yes, we will you know, buy 10 gigawatts of electricity. That's where Westinghouse and GE come into the picture. So once that letter was written, and the so-called, uh, what I call the irrita irritation causing you know, language was removed, then the 123 agreement was signed. So what is the 123 agreement? Reprocessing of used fuel, Guaranteed fuel supply, okay. uh, return to nuclear testing, which was a point of disagreement. So the two countries decided not to mention that in the one, two, three agreement. Uh, fallback option on safeguarding. If IAEA cannot, then the US would take over. And the agreement was voted by the US Congress by up down vote and signed in 2008, so it's almost exactly 10 years ago this was signed. And then as I mentioned, because of Japanese ownership of GE and uh, Westinghouse, they had to sign a one two, three agreement also with Japan, which actually was entered into force just one year ago. So the whole process start, took actually from 2005 to 2017, 12 years. Now, obviously, once you finish the one, two, three, as you know, you have to go to IAEA, which is the NSG. So they had to prepare a special waiver, considering the fact that India is not a signatory to NPT. So uh, the US continued to push that, and I think uh, India is very appreciative of the fact that it was, you know, uh, effectively kept its promise, you know, to do that. And so you can see that U.S. played a very active role in advocating India's case. And India is being considered for NSG membership, but some countries, particularly China, is objecting to that, even today. But India is already a member of some of the other regimes, which many of you probably know. The missile <coughs> technology, the Australia group, and the Vasanan arrangement. So, it's interesting that in 1975, the NSG was formed as a counter to what India did in 74. 
And now I think, you know, they are probably in wanting to include India into NSG, but China is objecting, I think, for political reasons. Okay. So now comes the nuclear liability issue. Many of you know that IAEA has a clause in it called the Convention on Supplementary Compensation. Like in the case of an accident, then I think the amount is some $300 million or something like that. But what happened is, at that time in 2010, 2010, uh, suddenly the government of India uh, brought up the issue of union carbide. If you, if you know, in 1984, there was a major union carbide accident which killed 25,000 people at that time. And the compensation according to the government of India was not sufficient to you know, recover that many people and all the issues that caused by the accident. So the government said that $300 million is really not the right amount, it is something much more, and that the suppliers are to be liable if an accident happens, like in the case of Union Carbide, it was a supplier. But then, uh, but, uh, but all across other nations, everybody except the CSC and uh, the Indian nuclear liability law enables seeking of damage compensation from the suppliers, which meant that you know the suppliers mean the reactor manufacturers like you know Toshiba and Hitachi and GE and Westinghouse. They said that look, we cannot sign this. And in fact, there is an interesting comment which was made by Jeff Himmel that uh, there is an extremely standard language and that he is not going to put G at risk, you know, by signing the agreement with India. And Russian and French reactor vendors also express very similar, you know, concerns, by the way. So what was done? I mean, the government of India said we will not change the law. The government of the United States said, hey, look, I think this is our agreement. Where do we go from here? So then I think you know when presidents and prime minister get together, they tend to become very creative. And that creativity, I don't know if it's creativity or wordsmithing, but then they said that the government of India will uh, develop a separate insurance pool which will go beyond this so far $300 million you know, upper bound if an accident will happen. And since you are not going to change the basic Indian law or the wording of it, what you will do is we will interpret the Indian law in the way we want to interpret. So just think of this, tweak the rules and definitions in the law. The nuclear power group corporation could be defined as both operator and supplier since it provides design specifications for reactors it operates and the vendors would then be called fabricators and contractors and not suppliers. So some wordsmithing was done. And then now I think both Westinghouse, uh, Arriva, and GE now have uh, Indian nuclear sites in a way they put their reactors. So they're actually planning to have, I don't know uh, how soon it will happen, but they are thinking of having uh, almost six reactors in each of the reactor parks. So there were some additional hurdles, by the way. Okay, I'll take another five, 10 minutes. Uh, the additional hurdles were the Indian government and also some of the other countries started objecting that, look, if you, you are selling old technology to us, so uh, we don't want to buy any US reactors. So what the State Department did was actually have a delegation of newsmen or news writers or from different nations to the United States and effectively I believe they, they had come to Berkeley also and I know they came to Virginia Tech 
and we effectively explain to them that indeed the AP1000 and some other reactors are the same ones which are being used in the US and the same ones are actually being marketed there. So again, this shows uh, all the new reactor sites as I was mentioning. Uh, what is important here for you to know that the Russians have already put two operating reactors and President Putin was in India just about two weeks ago and they have now signed for another six reactors you know, to be built at another site in India. So the Russians are moving quite aggressively in that area but I think uh, Riva, G and uh, Westinghouse also have been assigned sites to move forward. Uh, this is something which I told you about, uh, the uh, agreement between US, uh, India and Fermilab in terms of the proton accelerators. Uh, this is the agreement that was signed. Uh, I don't think any of you know who this person is. It's Pierre Odoni. He was the director of Fermilab. He had uh, signed the agreement I was sending there. <laughs> Uh, this is the MOU between Idaho National Lab in India and these are the areas where the R&D is the you know, Thoria fuel cycle modeling and simulation, nuclear facility safety and advanced nuclear fuels. So you can probably connect with INL and find out what is really happening in terms of the R&D partnership between US and India at this time. I think I just talked about NEDO. So go forward with it. Something interesting is happening between US and India beyond just nuclear reactors. First of all, both the nations are actually talking about uh, uh, having US help India design its next generation aircraft carrier. So they are in fact, they have a logo and some pins now. So forward together we go. <coughs> Then, in addition, India is currently leasing an Atulak-1 class Russian nuclear submarine for 10 years. And in addition, it is in talks for leasing another one. So it's almost a billion dollars uh, for the 10 year lease. So they are, I think the objective probably is to get some experience in operating nuclear power submarines. But they are also building their own nuclear submarines and in fact just very recently they launched a submarine launch ballistic you know missile from one of the submarines from underwater so there is a lot of thing going on in that part of the world uh, even china has a very strong slbm fleet at this time so you need heu for the nuclear submarines so india is actually build, uh, building another facility called the Special Materials Enrichment Facility, SMEF, in a town called Chalakere in South India, <coughs> which will support the submarine program. And Chalakere, if you go back, it is evolving as a city like Oak Ridge, by the way. You know, Oak Ridge has national labs, uranium enrichment, things like that. So something like that. I think I talked with you about uh, the NIF, Thing. Something I want to mention here, this is a, a paper by Sig Hecker, you know, the former director of Salomos, who I don't know is at the Hoover Institution in Stanford. And so he said that adventures in scientific nuclear diplomacy. Uh, so I don't know if you know that, but he has traveled to North Korea quite a bit. In fact, he has been one of the principal persons to interact with North Korea. Now let me bring up something. I have a few copies here I brought. You can please look at this. This is an extract from Time magazine exactly 25 years ago. <laughs> I have a few copies. You can put If you look at this, you will see that where the US and North Korea was 25 years ago, exactly where US and Korea is North Korea today. 
And I think I'm not being critical of Sig Hector or anything like that, but I wanted to leave a message here that yes, but scientific nuclear diplomacy hasn't always worked. Because nations who want to move ahead in what they want to do for their own safety, security purposes, and that is one very important lesson here. But you know, going back to India, I think if you go back during the Eisenhower times, I think this is Prime Minister Nehru, you know, I think we were doing handshakes. But today, I think it's an embrace. And it's a very different state of affairs. It's not that uh, India and US are allies or anything like that, but still it is uh, vast different than what it was you know, 10, 20, 15 years ago. So I want to thank uh, several people here. One is Ambassador Munford, uh, who actually hired me, by the way, to go to India, by the way. And uh, without him, I don't think this deal would have happened. Because he was in India as an ambassador for a long period of time, five years. And uh, as I said, you know, this uh, interesting, complex politics within the embassy, you know, democratic, republican philosophies and things like that, I think he effectively moved it forward, you know, very determined to make it happen. Uh, I think I <coughs> worked quite a bit with Harold McFarlane, who was the ANS president at that time. And uh, I think uh, later on, Harold, myself, and director of IDA National Lab, John Rosenbacher, we actually went to India for three weeks in 2011. That's when the MOU was signed between it. I, I love National Lab and Department of Atomic Energy India. Uh, I'd like to thank Professor Jasmina Gurhi, who is left, but she and I work quite closely on this NATO thing, by the way. So uh, we have to thank her for that. And then uh, I have quite a bit of interaction with Dr. Mishra, with Formula, you know, the proton accelerator. And in this context, I do want to mention that. I have also worked very closely with Carl Van Bieber because he was in physics at Livermore, I was in engineering, and then he and I always collaborated with accelerators, me from engineering, he from physics. So, in effect, I think you know, I'm among friends. Thank you. Right, thank you. <laughs> presentation. Um, of course, time is a bit advanced already. Do you have questions? minutes to close. You gave a nice, nice uh, perspective on the challenges of course implementing agreements taking 12 years and then, of course realizing also how quickly they, they can go away takes long time and then it's still not clear that they will be fine. No, I mean it's, it, you, it takes a long time to establish these agreements. Yeah, again, as I said, it's a 12 year effort. Yes. So people thought that 2008 everything is signed, but then as you know, the, the Japanese diet was not too keen on moving forward on this. So the Prime Minister had to keep on talking with Shinzo Abe and things like that to make this happen. Because without that, uh, nothing could really move forward. And then the, the US, I mean the resting houses and the GEs and the Divas, uh, or the, the GEs and the uh, resting houses, they were getting upset, not upset, but concerned that, look, it is a decade since this has happened, but nothing is happening on the ground. Right. So uh, how do we move forward? Or what is it that the government wants? But I, I think the key thing is that the sites are assigned. Uh, so there is a lot of preliminary work ongoing in these sites. And I think no official agreement has been signed as it between what I call the contract between Arriva and Westinghouse and GE, but what I call a preliminary agreement has been signed with that. The Russians, of course, you know, this, uh, the, the two operating reactors, the BBERs, I mean, they have been in this pipeline for the past eight, nine years. But, but the point 
to some degree, you know, now we have external, external companies and countries coming in to build reactors in India. I exactly. was wondering, of course, what about India itself? Right? And since we at UC Berkeley, an academic institution, and have a lot of our students involved in, in creating really the next generation of nuclear power plants, of course, it would be interesting to see what's going on in India with regard to the next generation of in academia and, of course, and ultimately in really building the reactors. And there's certainly a lot of opportunities. A lot of opportunities. I mean, and this is, uh, I don't think this uh, strategy will change. But I think, as I was mentioning to you, that dealing with the Indian side, uh, there are two very important things. One is, if you go there and tell them that, okay, you're not doing it right, we'll tell you what to do, they will not like it. So the best thing is, you know, to sort of work at a, at a partnership level. And that's why I think while I was there, I tried to put uh, these mechanisms of uh, interaction. I think if you have those mechanisms, then you don't have to reinvent, you know, the same issues which come up when you're dealing with on the nuclear issues. So uh, I think uh, within the umbrella of the INEL organization, there is an R&D effort. Uh, I was telling that maybe we should resurrect the NEDO uh, effort and uh, reconnect with what I call uh, somebody who will champion from the Indian side and from the US side. And then, of course, the commercial side is moving forward quite a bit. And then on the defense side, I think a lot of things are happening at this time. So I was actually myself quite surprised that the US and India were talking about you know, the U.S. helping India with this, uh, you know, the aircraft carrier. So, but uh, given the fact that there was so much sanctions and tensions and anger and sort of a lot of effort was spent on what I could call as clearing the underbrush, that was most important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.